Okay, gang, welcome back. We start another week, March the 8th, the second week of the month of March, 2010. And we have one heck of a program for you tonight. This is a world exclusive, and I am very gratefully thankful for uh, two gentlemen who have made this program possible tonight. And, of course, the prime gentleman who will be with us in just a few minutes to tell his personal story and reminiscences of an extraordinary event that he, well, he lived a piece of history that has been uh, commemorated in a book written by Ruben Uriarte and Noe Torres. The book is an extraordinary account. It is called The Other Roswell, UFO Crash on the Texas-Mexico Border. The story has to do with the events surrounding the crash of a UFO and a U.S. Air Force Reserve pilot, Colonel Robert A. Willingham, U.S. Air Force Reserve, now retired. Let's find out uh, if everybody's online now. Ruben, are you there? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm online here. Welcome back. It's good to talk to you again. Always there, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, Ruben is the Northern California State Director of the Mutual UFO Network. Noe, are you there? Yes, Jeff. I'm hoping that you all can hear me fine. I'm calling from in from South Texas, and I'm very, very delighted to be on tonight. Good, Noe. We hear you just fine. Noe Torres, the co-author of the book The Other Roswell with Ruben Uriarte. This is, again, a, a world exclusive. For the first time ever, Colonel Robert Willingham, U.S. Air Force Reserve retired, is going to tell his story live on radio. Ruben, when did you first come across this story? Well, um, both Noe and I have been working on our first research, with, which was Mexico's Roswell, the crash in Coyama, Chihuahua, Mexico. Right. And one of the things that we kept coming across was a reference to other UFO crashes along the border. And uh, Noe uh, had gotten in touch with Dr. Bruce McAbee to find out more about this one particular event that occurred uh, close to Del Rio, Texas. And from that, uh, we were very, very fortunate, Jeff, to get in contact with uh, Colonel Willingham. Um, we consider him as a as one of America's true authentic heroes, as you will be here shortly. So um, he shared with us his uh, his un- unique experiences, and we're very, very happy that uh, we were able to publish his story in, in in the book, and the fact that he's still around to share his experience. Right. Noe, the book itself, The Other Roswell, available on your website, uh, you and Ruben's website, roswellbooks.com, which is available by simply clicking on either Ruben or Noe's names. You'll go right there. I would urge all of you to get the book. In fact, all three of their books are extraordinary, to put it mildly. These are major contributions to the Research of uh, ET and UFO visitation to this planet, which goes on all the time. Let me just read, if I might, a little bit uh, of the description of the book to help and get a comment from Noe, and then we'll uh, meet the colonel himself. On a clear spring day in 1955, an Air Force reservist, Robert Willingham, was piloting an F-86 fighter jet across West Texas when he saw an intensely bright UFO streak passed his aircraft at over 2,000 miles an hour and then crashed land along the banks of the Rio Grande River where he later found smoldering twisted wreckage that convinced him the object was not of this earth. It was a very exciting development for us, Jeff. We uh, were working, as Ruben said, on our first book and then we heard bits and pieces of this story about something else that had happened back in the 1950s I contacted Dr. Bruce McAbee, and he told me that he had just uh, received a videotape of Colonel Willingham speaking to a reporter from a Dallas, Texas television station. Mm -hmm. So he had been interviewed uh, about his incident uh, in 1999, as it turns out, and uh, Dr. McAbee had the videotape of that, which he shared with us. So then it was a matter of uh, tracing him down. Uh, we contacted the Dallas TV station, and they gave us a lead as to where Colonel Willingham resided, which was near Wichita Falls. And Ruben and I actually went out to visit with him. Uh, we've been out there a couple of times. Uh, we sat in his living room and, and talked to him. Uh, we were very impressed by his story, his vivid uh, memories of what happened that day. 
certainly a, a life-changing experience that he underwent that really impacted the rest of his life. So after hearing his remarkable story, which uh, your listeners are about to hear in just a few moments, uh, after hearing that, we became convinced that uh, this gentleman uh, lived through an experience such as few other human beings have, have ever uh, known. Indeed. And the number of U.S. Air Force or other military aviators who have come forward to tell their story uh, is, well, a handful. Uh, very, very few people have the courage. And I think uh, this is evidence of Colonel Robert Willingham's understanding that uh, there are bigger things on this planet than the military. And uh, even though he came from a different age when you were told to do something, you did it in the military, he has very bravely and heroically come forward to tell his story to both uh, Noe and Ruben. He's going to share that with us tonight. Let's find out if Colonel Robert B. Willingham is uh, online right now. Are you there, Colonel? Yes, sir. Well, sir, thank you very much for being here with us tonight. It, uh, I am very much honored, as are all of our listeners, and we are very grateful for you for being here tonight. Well, my two buddies you got there with you, and uh, I appreciate you all inviting me to be with you. Well, it's... And uh, I, like, I like to talk to them. They're, they're nice people. They're as nice as they get. You got that one right, sir. <laughs> Let, let me ask you a question, Colonel. At what point in your life uh, did you decide to come forward with this story? And prior to that, uh, how were you instructed in the past not to talk about this event? Then we'll go into the event itself. Well, we I started, got the first part of that back in about uh, 61 about <clears throat> then, mm-hmm. uh, to get on the program to talk about uh, these crashes that are having around everywhere. But I'd been working on it since 1947. And uh, we'd travel around and look at these crashes and see if we could figure out what they were and what they weren't. And I had uh, another guy with me, a little heavy set guy that thought, passed away. He's the one that started me on this stuff. And uh, he passed on here about 10 years ago. And, when, when, uh, uh, really, Colonel, Colonel, excuse me, when you say you've been involved with this since back in 1947, was that as a military aviator or is it a, a private citizen doing research into these things? Well, that, that was private citizens doing that. I see. All right. Yeah. So even before you were flying uh, on the day in question in 1955, you had an interest in the UFO issue and had been researching it since 47. 47, of course, is the year of Roswell. Would that have been your first major no, case sir. that you worked on? No, that wasn't the first one I was on. The first one I was on right south of Elmire, New York. When you say the first one you were on, who put you on it? This friend of yours who passed on ten years ago? Yes, sure was. So just the two of you were investigating these things? Right. That's fascinating. Ask, uh, yeah, ask your friend there. Uh, He knows his name. All right. We'll get there. Hang on, Colonel, if you would. We have to pause just for a couple of minutes. We'll come right back. Talking with Colonel Robert B. Willingham in a world exclusive here, he is going to tell his story of what happened in 1955. But very interestingly, he already had a very solid interest in researching the idea of UFO crashes and that they were real. And he had been involved with it since 1947, which is eight years before the event you're going to hear described in just a few minutes. My guests are Noe Torres and Rupert Uriarte, and Ruben and I and Noe will be right back with the Colonel in just a couple minutes.
Okay, welcome back. Jeff Rents with Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte and Colonel Willingham, the man of the hour. All right, Colonel Willingham, another question or two, just if I may, about the other crashes you were investigating. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, Network, if you could just take uh, Ruben and Noe down for a couple of minutes, I think it will clear up the line just a little bit so we have a little crisper. There we go. The other cash, uh, crash cases you were investigating from 1947 on, as you and your friend, private citizens, what did you find out? What did you learn? What did you discover about the? And how many cases were there between 1947 and 55, approximately, that you were involved with? Again, as private citizens. Well, uh, he and I, uh, he would work all week on it, but I was having to fly most of the time, and different places. I was flying pipelines and coastlines and what have you. Uh-huh. And uh, we'd uh, go out on the weekend and uh, look at these places that he found where they had crashed. Sometimes it wasn't nothing but scrap pieces of tin or maybe a little framework and first one thing or another. But they all look like something like something would come out of the universe, you know. That so we don't you, know nothing about. So you were but, you were actually fairly well familiar with this whole concept of UFOs crashing beforehand. Now I might ask the obvious question: How did your friend come to find knowledge about the locations of these crashes? Well, uh, he he did that. He he worked at the university up there in. Uh, Ohio, uh-huh. and uh, he was getting all kinds of it because they had a contract to test these things to make sure that they were happening and what what it was. I never did hear any of them say what they were, but uh, I read a lot about what they had found and different chemicals and uh metal uh, content and uh, different things like that, but that's about all. So I you, never did. Go ahead. No, sir, you go ahead, please. Well, anyway, uh, we uh, worked uh, New York. We had two in New York, one right. up at, uh, in that area, and uh Right south of New York City, about eight miles, one crashed. And we went and tested that out. I think it was in about 49, I believe it was, or something like that. It was just a little while before I went to Korea. And uh, we were on the way to... Korea, and we saw a couple out the window. And huh. We took note of that and told the pilot and everything to find out what location we were and all mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. and then we'd check on it later when we got back home. Okay, Colonel, now when you and your friend went to these crash sites, uh, yeah. were, the cra- were the crash sites still open, or had they been already gone through by the government? Were most of the wreckage pieces picked up? You know how thorough they are with these things. I'm I'm surprised you got there and there was anything there at all. Uh, he found out before the government did, I think. That's am- my idea of it. <laughs> That's amazing. But- now, about how yeah. many about how many were there between 1947 and 55 that you personally went and looked at? I think they were six of them. My goodness. Best I can remember. All right. Now, were in any case the craft or large pieces of the craft still on the ground, and were you able to go inside to look at the interior, or were they just, as you said, pretty much piles of scrap metal? That's just about all. Every one of them I went to was that getting early. So they hit the ground pretty hard. Did you see 
Uh, strange symbols. Did you see evidence of some kind of mechanical control device? Did you see well, very unusual construction? What did you see? Uh, the only thing we found on most of them was the uh, pieces of metal that was holding the uh, cover on it. And they had strange uh, markings on them, like uh, we do... Uh, we put A, B, C, and uh, J, F, K, or whatever what that is, on different metals that we put out for right on there. Well, they had that on there, but we never could figure out what they were supposed to be. They were symbols of some kind. They were symbols of some kind, and uh, he was really working on that when we when he passed on. This is an extraordinary. And I never did. Huh? I say this is an extraordinary friend of yours. This guy had some some abilities that are amazing. Yeah, he sure did. That's why I like to work with him. <laughs> I I say I'd I'd be right with him too. All right, now uh, we could spend a lot more time on that. But when we come back, I want you to start telling us your story in 1955 as an Air okay. Force F-86 pilot. And we'll go through that as well. I uh, am truly honored to have you on the program sir and and to have you step forward like this there are probably scores if not hundreds of aviators who have taken perhaps similar experiences with them when they leave this uh thing we call life and go on to the next stage they don't share and you've stepped up and you're sharing and that's just a well uh the pilots that i flew with in, in different areas uh, they were making a career out of what they were doing, and they was asked not to say anything or discuss I understand. anything okay. about it. All right, we'll be right back in just a minute. Okay, let's get right back to our special program. Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte are standing by. We're talking with Colonel Willingham about uh, a day in 1955 that is uh, utterly extraordinary. And the story is all the more extraordinary because he lived it. He was in the Air Force. He is telling the story now. And there are so many people in the military who know things, see things, experience things, participate in things, who take it with them. This is one of the men who did not do that, and we are uh, eminently and eternally grateful for this information. When you click on Colonel Willingham's name at rents.com and guests, you'll see three pictures. We hope to add several more shortly. One of them is his uh, F-86 as he first sees the object overhead. The second is self-explanatory, and the third we will get to as well. All right, Colonel Willingham, if you would, sir, please take it from the top, 1955, what was happening on that day when this whole thing began to unroll? All right. Sure will. Uh, we were assigned to a uh, wingtip uh, watch over a 47 that left up in New York, came down through Oklahoma and down the through Archer County and back over and went and heading to El Paso, and we supposed to fly cover for it. Now, when you say a 47, you're talking about a B-47? Yes. Okay. And why were you flying cover for a B-47? Uh, I don't they, well, I wasn't told why I was supposed to. I just told to do it. <laughs> I'll bet you uh, were just told to do it. Could it possibly be that that B-47 was carrying a certain something in its bomb bay? It could have had. Okay. Just pretty just, heavy one, too, I think. Just fishing. All right. It had big, big sufficient arms, you know. I see. I got it. Okay. okay. All right. So you're flying cover. Uh, you and how many uh, fellow There's pilots? Four of us. Four of, All right. Four of us out of Dallas. Were you boxing? Out were of you? Four. Out of Fort Worth, were you boxing him in front and rear and side to side? Yeah, just exactly. All right, I got the picture now. B-47, for any of you who want to know, can simply type in B-47 
47, the numerals, on any search engine, you'll see a picture of this uh, this jet uh, bomber, uh, which was carrying, obviously, a very special cargo at that time on that day. All right, sir, go right ahead. Uh, we flying along there, and uh, my buddy back there said he, on my unicom between the aircraft, mm-hmm. uh, he said, hey, look at that big star falling or everywhere it is over there. And I looked at it, and they, everybody else looked at it, and I said, yeah, that, that, that is falling, ain't it? And I said, you sure that's a star? I said, it looks to me like it's something else. And it was real bright. And uh, finally it made a 90-degree turn at 2,000 miles an hour, and I didn't figure it was. Well, shooting stars and meteorites don't change course. Not like that. That's that's right. And uh, so uh, I I asked the captain on uh, 47 if I could trace it, see where it was going, because we didn't know what it was. And he said, yeah, just a minute, let me see if we can do that. And... uh, he he came back in a few minutes. He said, "Yeah, go ahead. Just you though, not the rest of them." So I took off down there, and when I got to where it was, right below Langtree, Texas, on the uh, over on the Mexican side. We're we're looking at the picture, Colonel, and the drawing, the artist's conception of that when you first saw it, looking up to your right slightly, apparently overhead. This was prior, yeah. is this prior to the 90 degree turn that the object made? No, that probably was part of the 90 degree. I've I seen see. that picture you had there, but I don't think it was drawn exactly the way it was supposed to be where it made the 90 degree turn. That thing actually just took a, a absolute flat on out 90 degree change in direction at 2,000 miles an hour, leaving a, a contrail of some kind behind it. Right, right. That must have just knocked your eyeballs. It sure did. <laughs> I was hoping to have one by the next year that I could fly myself. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true <laughs> aviator hero. That's great. <laughs> All right, so it makes a 90-degree turn. At that point, did it begin to descend below your flight altitude? Yes, sure did. We were flying along about 35,000 at that time. And uh, I took off after it, and it hit just about the time I got about halfway there. Okay, it dropped below you. So you uh, you went uh, uh, starboard or port toward it. Which direction did you descend? Remember? I had to go, uh, let's see, I had to go starboard there for about five or eight minutes. And then I had, I had to kind of circle around. Mm-hmm. And uh, that time, the Mexican. And uh, government they had started uh, sending in their troops over. All right. So by the time you took you five to eight minutes to drop down to get close to the deck to see this thing, which uh, you could tell, I guess, from uh, before you got there, had come in for some kind of an impact landing. Well, I don't think it was trying to land. I think they'd already lost control of it. I see. Or that was my idea. Mm-hmm. Right, and, as, you're, uh, as you're coming down uh, toward the, the Rio Grande River, and you're coming down, and this thing is on the ground, as you approach it, what do you see exactly? I is just see where it hit, about 100 yards up from the water bank, and uh, kind of bounced a few times. And just kept on going, uh, I'd say it went out through there about a thousand yards. Did you actually see it, Colonel, hit the ground? Well, uh, I didn't actually see it hit the ground. I had seen it when it finally got stopped. I had got that close. I see. That I could see it. Uh-huh. All but right. it was breaking up pretty bad there 
when I seen it. Do you do you feel that uh, you got there just at the time it stopped moving, or did it take you another minute to get there after it had stopped moving once it hit the ground? Well, it was uh, about a minute or so after that, or it could have been 30 seconds, because when you're watching something like this, the time goes by pretty fast. I understand. All right, yeah. hold, hold on, Colonel. We have to take another little break. We'll come right back and continue your well, story. Well, I'm going to go get a drink of water. You bet. Go right ahead. All right. All right. This is uh, this is really amazing. For all of you who are online, do click on Colonel Robert Willingham's name. Take a look at the three pictures. And, Reuben, if you can send the other pictures along again, I've sent you an email. We'll put those up as well. Uh, these are very good artist concepts of what... Uh, Colonel Willingham experienced that day, accurately marked F-86, and all the rest of it. Uh, Just an extraordinary event. Be right back with more in just a minute. Okay, and we're back with retired U.S. Air Force Reserve pilot Colonel Robert Willingham, and we're talking about an amazing event. Colonel, let me stop just for a minute and take a a real quick sidetrack. When you joined the Air Force and became a, a pilot, an aviator, did the Air Force know of your earlier interest and apparent visits to up to seven crashed UFO sites, or did you keep that quiet? Oh, no, I kept it quiet. <laughs> You're sly. I knew how the Air Force felt about it. Aha. Uh-huh. Very yeah. good. Very smart They man. were having some hot arguments over different things that they come up with on there. You, I you, can understand uh-huh. how our Air Force and government and everything else works when they something they don't know nothing about. They make everybody keep quiet. Of course. Well, they're still yeah. trying to do that today. But Yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about, yeah. But they do, in fact, now, as you well know, and probably for the better part of 50 years, have crash retrieval teams ready to roll out 24 hours, 7 days a week, 365 a year, to pounce on these things and recover the debris, the wreckage, or the craft intact, if one happens to come down reasonably intact, and the occupants inside. They didn't back then, though. Yeah, I went down to uh, White Sands and looked at some of the stuff they picked up one time. Oh, they let you look at it? Yeah, I went down there to see what they had. It didn't look anything near like what we had. I mean, what we... Yeah. Picking up and looking at, you how, know. Colonel, how did they come to let you in to see this obviously highly classified ultra top secret wreckage? How did you get well, in? Well, I do have that kind of clearance. And you got that as a reserve pilot? No. All right. There's more to this story, and I'm not going to push and get in the way here of it. But uh, Well, I, I can't talk about it anyway. All right. Very good, sir. I understand. You've shared okay. a tremendous amount already. Now, you're flying your F-86 down. You see the object on the ground. Uh, it had been down for no more than maybe 30 seconds by the time you flew over it, something like that? That's right. I made one circle around it. All right. And looked it over, and then I headed back to my job uh, after the B-47. Okay. And, Does that, uh, are you saying you you had to... Trying to rejoin the B-47? Yes, sir. All right, so you had to climb way back up to 35,000 feet or thereabouts to assume your position in that box formation of security around the B-47 bomber. Well, uh, the bomber had already nearly got to El Paso. All right. And they were going to take another team to fly a wing for it on... uh, to Arizona. Okay, understand. So uh, they called and told me, said, no, you can go on back to the base 
and you want to go out there and look at that anyway? And I said, yes, I do. So they, I took mine and went on back, and about five minutes after I was there, maybe ten, uh, the rest of them came on in. And the we other landed. Three, your other three squadron uh, mates, okay? Yeah. That's where right. we were stationed at, the Carswell Air Force Base. All right, Carswell, yeah, all right. So you, you flew back to base. Now, yeah. let me ask you another question here, please. Did right. you Did you, at this point in your Air Force career, have that security clearance that you mentioned, or was that to come later on? No, I was doing a job when I got out of the Army. Mm-hmm. See, I, did, I didn't join the Air Force. I went to the 288th Combat Engineers, 3rd Army, in Germany when I went to the service. Was that in the war? Yes. It All wasn't right. quite over with. All right, I so think it, go ahead. It was over with about, uh, I think, about six weeks later. All right. When Because we were in uh, April, and it was the 7th of May, or 9th of May is when the war was over with. Understand. That must have been uh, one hell of a scene, uh, Germany just decimated like that to uh, to walk through and to be stationed at. What a... What have seen? Yes, it was. <laughs> now, so after the military, the army, then you joined the air force. Okay. Well, I went to Korea as a pilot uh-huh. or uh, as a radar technician. All right. We had me and a uh, five, five guys worked on radar systems over here in Wichita Falls. Mm-hmm. And uh, we come up with some ideas to make them stronger where they could reach further and everything. And they, me and my buddy, uh, the general said, you get your stuff ready and we'll ship you to Korea. And we, they said, all right. And said, we'll have you the 636 radar squadron there mm-hmm. for you to work on there. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, that's a tight radar systems we had that were working on. All right. That's uh, obviously uh, very highly classified work at that point in time. I understand. Yes, it was. All right. Uh, you couldn't talk about what you'd done or what you were going to do or what what was happening, you know. I understand. <clears throat> but anyway, we uh, went ahead and got that there, and we got all set up, and Waited two weeks, and they didn't show up. And I said, you're a P-51 pilot, aren't you? And he said, yeah. I said, hey, there's two old P-51s out there. Let's go get them and get the mechanics out of here and get them all together and fly them. What do you say? Yeah, that'd be a good idea. Wait a minute. Well, so where, were the, to... where were you when you decided to take these P-51s? Uh, that was on that island off the mainland of Korea. Okay. Honshu or something? I can't remember the name of it. One of them. I can't either. All right. I've so. Had... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. You see, I've had uh, what? I've had two bad strokes and five little strokes. I can't see. Th- think too fast or too far either. <laughs> well, you're putting a lot of me to shame right now with the way you're remembering this and bringing it out, so don't don't even talk there. I, That's amazing what you remember. You're doing wonderfully. The uh, So you got on these two P-51s. What was the idea? You were you were going to fly them where? Uh, we were going to strafe uh, for the 2nd Marine Division that was uh, over in the mainland. When did you learn to fly, Robert? I don't understand. You were an army and you were in the engineers in the end of World War II. When did you get your flight training and certification? For, 47. I got my uh, field commission and they asked me what I was go- would I like to go to school to do something. And I said, yeah, I want to be a pilot. And the minute I got to the state, they called me about Oh, a month later, and told me 
my appointment had come through. So I went to training in them. Very good. All right. So you you popped in the 51s and, and, uh, and took off and did your job helping the Marines. Um, and then after the Korean War, you came back and got checked out on 86s, or was that during the Korean War? Well, I got to check out while the, the Koreans. See, I went to Korea in 50. Ah, early. And it wasn't over until 53, I think it was, or mm-hmm. 54, mm-hmm. somewhere wrong in there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> but they blowed me out of a hole. I like to lost both legs then. You got shot down? Ah. Uh, you were shot down? Yeah. On a I like 50- lost both kneecaps. They shipped me to Tokyo Hospital. And, uh, boy, I tell you, those Japanese operators were pretty good, I'll tell you, because they lasted nearly 12 years after they operated on them before I started having any more trouble. Oh, well, that's nice. So you, you got, you're able to get your 86 training and, and fly that and, and actually experience what you're talking about tonight. Were you shot down in a P-51? No. <laughs> we we were going to go to uh to Korea uh to Tokyo mm-hmm. and uh have a weekend off. Right. And oh. we got uh, airborne and was out about uh five minutes and we shot us down. Who shot you down? The North, Koreans did. North, North Koreans did. But what were you flying in? Uh, we were in a C-47. Ah, I thought it was a bigger aircraft. Okay. Yeah. There was about ten of us on there. Pilot was able to make a crash landing? Yeah. We crashed right down the shoreline of the <laughs> at a little island out there. Amazing. Called Kiwi. Amazing. Amazing story. All right. We're coming up on another short break here. I want you to go get another drink of water. And when we okay. come back, when we come back, we're going to pick up the story. When you flew back to Carswell, uh, checked your F-86 in, and then went back to the crash location of this disc you had seen come down to earth and hit the deck about 100 yards from the Rio Grande River. We'll do that. Well, I just... sure like to get in trouble all the time, too. Yeah, all right. You hang on. This is a great story. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. <laughs> all right. Stand by. Go get a drink of water. We'll be gone for about four minutes, and then we'll talk to you again. All right. Colonel Robert B. Willingham, uh, U.S. Air Force Reserve, uh, retired war hero, World War II, Korean War service veteran. This is an amazing American and he is telling a story that I think we could all spend hours talking to him about. Uh, there just aren't folks like that around very often anymore. Uh, Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte are with us as well, listening in. They've written a book about this. You can find it at roswellbooks.com. And we'll be right back. Glad you're along with us tonight. A very special program this evening. Ruben Uriarte and Noe Torre is making it possible. Those gentlemen are standing by listening in. Our very special guest tonight is Colonel Robert Willingham, U.S. Air Force Reserve, retired, World War II, Korean War veteran, a true hero of this nation and uh, of our country's history. He is telling us the story of 1955. We're jumping around a bit because his life is so extraordinary. Of the day he saw a disc, a UFO, from above when he was at 35,000 feet, come down, make a right-angle turn, and come all the way down and land near the Texas-Mexico border, about 100 yards from the Rio Grande River. Colonel, you wanted to tell us one thing right before we went to the break. Do you remember what that was? 
Now, what was I talking about? I can't remember, but he said, I'll tell you about that a little later. <laughs> okay. Only you know, well, sir. Well, I'm going to go back where we went and took the jet back. Yeah, you went back and parked at Carswell. Okay. Yeah, I parked the car. I got in the car and went down to Corsicana, where I used to fly out of that base down there. All right. And picked up a light aircraft and flew down to where the crash was. When you say you picked up a light aircraft, what did you do? Rent some little uh, single engine uh, No, craft? a good friend of mine down there had four of them, and he uh, used them for people that wanted to keep their flying time up. And... Uh, <clears throat> In fact, he even taught my wife how to fly. Um, nice. we picked a, I picked up a light aircraft. It was an L-16. All right. And didn't have no batteries, didn't have no generator or anything like that. No clearance lights, nothing on it. But it had a hell of a powerful rubber band, right? That's right. <laughs> all right. That's right. That's about all it had. <laughs> So I went on down there and found the place that was clean enough I could sit down. Uh huh. And I sat down. And uh, did uh, you have any trouble that, finding the location of the crash from the air? You remembered it pretty clearly, I guess. Yes, I did. I still got it right in my mind right now. All right. You just go from Langtree, Texas. Okay. Right straight to the river. And just on the other side of it was where it hit. All right. You landed how close to the crash itself? I'd say I was about 150, 200 yards. That's damn close. Okay. When you got there, what did you see? Well, I started up there, and here come all these Spanish uh, soldiers come running over, and they were all armed. <laughs> and I put up my hands like a being arrested, you know, or something. Really? Were you still in uniform? Yeah, I'm still in my flight suit. But it, anyway, they come on up there, and I told them, I said, I just come down to see what crashed here. I was here a while ago in that F-84. And he said, you were? And I said, yeah. I, I spoke a little Spanish, but uh, they were the lieutenant there. He spoke good English, so... I talked to him most and, of the and time. They, and they remembered your F-86 overflying the uh, location where they couldn't have been there already, or were they there that quickly? Well, they, they only had about four miles to drive. I see. So they had a base yeah. nearby, and they just saw this thing come down, and they zipped on over there. That's right. They just ah, okay. zipped right on over there. All right. So you're standing there with your arms up in your flight suit next to this little private plane, and you're 150 yards away from this crash disk. How many soldiers were there approximately there, and were they deployed in a circle around it or what? No, it was about, uh, I'd say, 150 there when I got there. All right, it's quite a number. Already. Right? Mm -hmm. And about 35 vehicles. Wow, all right. Could you see and the cr could you the vehicles on both sides. All right, could you see the craft itself? Yeah, yeah. I went in there and I was talking to this uh, Spanish uh, lieutenant. <clears throat> I used to remember his name, but I can't even think of it now. Uh, anyway, uh, I talked to him, and we walked down through there, and he said, i never seen anything like it before. And I said, no, I either. But I said, this site's a little different than some I've looked at. Mostly it was all uh, pieces of covering and stuff. It, it was all scattered everywhere. This in here had solid, some solid pieces still scattered down through there. All right, so some of it was intact. Did it have any markings or anything on the exterior, or was it just the skin of it? Well, uh, no, I... Picked up a little piece of it on the way out of there. Well, I know. And I want to get I, there. I want to get there in just a minute. Hold on with that, please. You, all you, right. Uh, you walk up to this thing. 
Well, the, did the Mexicans let you get close to it, or did they hold you off a little bit? No, they helped me off till the lieutenant got up there. All right, and when I he got there... They, I don't think they spoke uh, very good English, the rest of them did. All right. I hope they weren't putting their guns on you all this time. Well, they had them pointed that direction. <laughs> I get it. I get the picture. All right, so the lieutenant gets there. You walk up to the craft itself. How close did you get to it, Colonel? I, I walked right up and kicked a piece of it. Wow. All right. Were you? How big was it in diameter? About. Well, where it hit, it was a lot of small pieces, like two foot by eight inches, uh, maybe two foot by 28 inches, uh, just different pieces off of it, you know. Okay. Then it got on up to where it stopped. It looked to me like that it was a piece of 10 inch pipe that was real shiny. And I don't know if that was part of the fuel consumption part of it or what it was, but he didn't know either. The Mexican didn't. Could you see inside what was left of the intact craft? No. Wasn't, was, wasn't nothing like that in there. Was, there. was there any evidence of any life, dead or alive, around that object? Uh, they were on up front, according to them. They said, don't look like people, but said, we can't let you go up there. The general's already said no nobody look at that so the, he, they didn't even let they, the boys it was guarding it look at it oh really yeah okay so the front of the craft that impacted the ground uh, ripped a hole open inside and and apparently people could see in there and there were dead ets or they weren't humans there were dead bodies in there of some kind right right and you couldn't get around there to see in there either well, I kind of snuck around a little You're bit. You're a sneaky there, but... <laughs> fella, aren't you? All right, now tell it. You snuck around there a little bit, Colonel. What did you see? Well, it didn't look like uh, human beings to me. How many of them were there? I believe they were three, and uh, the lieutenant said they were four. All right. But I never did see the other one. Were the bodies mangled, or were they relatively intact, and what were they dressed in? Well, they weren't dressed at all. Okay. And they were in a lot of different pieces. I didn't see but one that had a complete top. But I wouldn't swear what he was eating. All right. What did the head look like? Anything like we've seen in the common research literature, the the big eyes, the smooth skin, or the little mouth? Did you see anything? Yeah, at least some of them uh, that, that looked like that. They, they just, I don't know how you'd explain it, but they, they just, their heads and uh, arms and stuff, their arms are a little bitty. Uh it looked like uh, broomsticks. Wow. Okay, but That's they had big... uh huh broomsticks. Go ahead. All right. No, no, I got you. They had no uniform on. They were just basically skin, if that's what their outer covering is. F yeah. No, any evidence that's... of blood? I didn't see any. Okay, but, but they were. They man, were all... I just got the glance in there. I because he, he wouldn't let me go look in it. I just happened to be walking by it and looking in there, you know, and he said, yeah. no, you can't do that. you got to come over here. You're a smart man. I'm glad you did. You, you, <laughs> the colonel actually got a look, uh, listeners, I'm sure you're right on this, of uh, the occupants of that craft, all uh, dead on uh, impact, apparently. And we'll come right back. Colonel, stand by if you would, please. Get yourself a drink of water. You're doing wonderfully here describing an extraordinary event. We'll come right back with Colonel Robert Willingham in just a couple of minutes. Back to business here. Our fascinating conversation with Colonel Robert Willingham. 
U.S. Air Force Reserve, retired American war hero, World War II, Korea War, and then some. And we've uploaded three more pictures. If you'll click on the colonel's name at rents.com, you'll see him uh, in his uh, uniform. You'll see him in a couple other uh, pictures as well, so enjoy those. And then the three images of the uh, jet when he first saw the object, the second image showing the F-86 coming down and circling over the crashed disc, and the third we're going to get to in just a minute. Okay, uh, you did, you're a sly one. You got around, you got to look in there, you got to look at these guys. Did you see anything on the inside, Colonel, that looked like controls or uh, creature comforts, chairs, consoles, anything at all that you can remember? Well, uh, yeah, I, and it's a little something else. You kept saying uh, a disc like it's no, it wasn't a disc like it was. Uh, oh, I'd say it was about the size, about four foot in the front. Right. And then it came back, being four feet, and then it squeezed down to about two feet. And then it came on down till it was about, oh, I'd say uh, about two feet on the back. But it didn't have any ailerons or anything like ours, do you? Know? All right. So it sounds like uh, you're describing kind of a like a a tadpole shape or something bigger in the front and more narrow in the back, like a teardrop. Right. Right. But the di- the image on our website shows a disc shape, so I'm glad you clarified that for us. Thank you. This was not yeah. a huge this was not a huge uh, piece of machinery, and yet it's up there at, at above 35,000 feet, doing 2,000 miles an hour, making aerodynamically absolutely fantastic movements, and then crashing. Yes, and that's what uh, when I got down there where I could see what I was looking at, you know. Yeah, I was thinking, now that's not even uh, aerodynamics uh, pattern. Right. But uh, it's uh, something different. Because the other crashes I looked at were round discs, some of them. Mm -hmm. Some of them were uh, like a big uh, tank, I guess you'd say. Mm, Okay. Uh, It was... About 12, 14 foot wide, and our uh, diameter sparks, uh-huh. you know. Yeah. And it, uh, they, they was just all different kinds of them. They, I, I don't believe I've seen but two that was just alike. How interesting. So of the seven or so you saw from 1947 to 1955, only two of them were what you would call possibly identical. The other five were all different. That's yeah, right. Yeah. What brought sure those, was. uh, Colonel, what brought those craft down in your estimation? Were they shot down? Did they just mechanically screw up? Or did our radar interfere with some of them? I figure that uh, probably the radar, uh, worked on their control of the, Engine that was driving it. Aha. Uh-huh. That's been suggested but, before, and I just wanted to ask you if you had any, any thoughts on that. Well, me and my buddy, uh, that we worked on with before, uh-huh. uh, that's what we was trying to find out how, what made it go. Yeah, I'd like to know and, that too. <laughs> yeah. I may mean, need a lot of people like to know. Yeah. Uh, wow. But I, I had them strokes, and I had to quit working on them. That's all it was to it. <clears throat> all right. So you walked around the front. You did see uh, at least three, maybe four uh, bodies in various pieces. One of them was half half together from the waist up or thereabout. They had broom yeah. handle uh, thickness arms. Their heads and can you legs. De- and legs? Can you describe the face at all? Just a little thin mouth. Did you see eyes? The top of their head was big. All right. Like from her eyes up. Now I have never these they draw on there of great big eyes. Yep. I ne- I never seen any of them. All right. The eyes look kind of normal size. 
Yeah, well, they was a lot smaller, but they were shaped different. Looked like the eyeball itself was sticking out past the eyelids hmm. on there. No hair they, at all? No hair. Uh, might have been a little on the back of some of them. Okay. Because there was some, something back there, but it didn't look like hair. It looked like something else. It might have been some uh, heat resistant stuff. I don't know. All right. Uh, know, last, back. last question about that. Were there any chairs or instrumentation that you could see in your quick glance inside there? I noticed in there that they were... Uh, Look like uh, seismograph machines in there, and a lot of writing on uh, ever what was under it. How interesting! Yeah, wow. very interesting. Was the uh, interior of the craft still lit up in any way, or did it have colors you could see in there of any kind? No, didn't see a thing like that. All right. I could, I didn't even see a dome light. <laughs> well, how interesting. Not even a dome light. But you looked at four dead fellow aviators in a way. Have you ever thought about that over the years? Uh, more than once. What would I have done if I was in that same condition? How interesting. That's, that's what I was trying to figure out. Yeah. All right. We got another uh, major thing coming up with the colonel in just a couple minutes stand by and we will continue with this uh, remarkable story i heard first on radio uh, here thanks to noe torres and ruben uriarte and of course colonel willingham Okay, we're back with our very special guest, Colonel Robert B. Willingham, U.S. Air Force Reserve, retired. All right, uh, Colonel, what happened after you walked around the craft and got your peak, invaluable peak inside? Uh, the lieutenant walked you away. Did he escort you away? Did he say you better walk away now? What did he do? Yeah, he said, let's turn around and go back. Uh, i got to get you out of here because the general's here. All right, well, he did. He did <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, he did you a favor, didn't he? Yes, he did. <laughs> yeah, I told him, I said, well, let's walk over and introduce me to him. He said, no, <laughs> we're going to get you out of here, so you get your airplane and get out of here. And I went back and got in there. And I went back home and it liked to got dark on me. I didn't have no clearance lights or nothing on that aircraft. <laughs> All right. Now, but before, Colonel... You got into your rubber band powered airplane with no clearance lights and all the rest of it. You you saw something on the ground. Yeah, I picked up a little piece of metal. Was there and, was uh, there a lot of it scattered all over the place? Yeah, it was scattered everywhere. And it was about I think six to eight inches wide. I measured it then, but I then forgot what it was. Mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, one side of it had the notches on it, like it was going to be in a, some kind of driver or something, you know. And he I had, excuse me, though, Colonel. Excuse me. I'm sorry. It had notches in it. Yeah, on one on one side. All right. Now there's and, a, there's, uh, a, there's an artist drawing of this, folks. Uh, you click on Colonel Willingham's name, and you'll see it. Uh, it had not, it's got notches on one side and little holes on the other side of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. you got that on, uh, yeah, it's on the, the TV, pe- huh? We got it on the, uh, internet, on the TV screen and people can see it. That's correct. Good. Then they know what I'm talking about. That's right. <laughs> they got an idea. It's slightly curved and, uh, you picked it up. And did you pretend to reach down to tie your shoelace when you grabbed this thing, or what? I sure did. <laughs> you did? Yeah, I sure did. <laughs> oh, you're amazing. All right, how did I know that? I had just probably done the same darn thing. Well, good well, for you. Anyway, I sent that to Ohio. Up good. there, uh, 
good military man that you are, you sent it to Wright Patterson, right? Right. And it disappeared in three days. Doggone this thing. Uh, now, if you had it to do over again, what would you have done? I'd have took it myself, and I'd have stayed with it. Yeah. Well... The major that I gave that to, he was a Marine. Mm-hmm. And uh, I never, I could never find him again. I went, I went to the Washington even trying to find him uh, through the their papers, uh, you know. Yeah, I understand. That they put on uh, ticker tape, you know, and stuff. Okay. Back, back then. Yeah. So you felt that that was your piece, and you wanted it back. That's right. Uh huh. Well, I agree with you. I'd have found out what it was too. Yeah, I believe it. Did you do anything with it? Did you do anything with it by way of testing it before you gave it to this major? Yeah, I tried to even grind it. It wouldn't. Eat. You couldn't grind it even. It was so hard. Was it heavy? I tried a file on it, and it, it cut the edges off my file. Wow. Was it light yeah. or heavy? Well, if that had been a piece of regular iron, it would have weighed probably six or eight pounds. Okay. That, I don't think, weighed over about three, maybe four pounds. All right. But I couldn't figure out how they could have got metal that hard and still be that light. You well, know. Um, yes, I understand. That's probably a question that uh, the military may know the answer to by now, given all the crashes that they've retrieved and all the rest of the pieces of hardware they've analyzed. But back then, right, in, in the right. 50s, so it took the edge off your metal file. Your grinder was useless on it. Wouldn't even scuff it up at all, huh? Not a bit. Were you married at the time? Yes. Did you show the missus? No. <laughs> All right. Understand. I sure did. I understand. Did yeah. anybody? All right. So you gave it to the major. It vanished. What contact did you have afterward from the military regarding? Uh, they knew you were there. They knew you picked up a piece and all that. So what happened after that? Uh, they sent. Four guys down, uh, I was living in Corsicana then, I think. Okay. Well, somewhere down there anyway. All right. Uh, sent four guys down there and told me they wanted it. <coughs> told me not to tell anybody about it or anything. How did they tell you? Did they, did they make it real clear that something nasty might happen to you if they, if you did, or did they just appeal to your service? Uh, allegiance to the country. Well, I think the first batch did uh, just ask me not to say anything about it. All right. And that was last. So then I come down here, and they've been talking to my mother. Oh. And my mother said, well, I know nothing about it, and if you want to talk to him, you let have to talk to him about it, because he, he's pretty secretive anyway. And I said, oh, don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, they come down. I see, I was at home, come home just about the time they left. And uh, I didn't get to see them myself. But then I was at uh, Pittsburgh checking one out. And uh, they'd won crash. North of Pittsburgh, or about 17 miles, I think it was. Was this later on? Yeah, this was before the first one. Okay, so this this is before 1955. Yeah, this was in uh, about 51, I believe. Okay, or two. all right. I was there uh, in on a crutch. I was walking around on crutches. Because your, cause your knees in the Korean War shoot down. <laughs> yeah. I got it. And, uh. Well, this, Colonel, this friend of yours, 
had some kind of a, an ability to figure out where these things were coming down, or he watched the newspapers or something, and you and he went around to all these crash sites. That's just amazing. Well, we tried to anyway. That's remarkable. All right. The, and, he, and he paid all the expenses. Was this guy, this friend of yours, in the in the government service at all at this time, did you feel? He was working in the Pentagon. <laughs> And he decided to take you with him. Well, he, no, no, I ran across him on one of these sites uh, over in the edge of New York. I and see. His, jo- his job was to go and find out all he can and then come back and tell him. Okay. Stand by, Colonel. We'll take a break. Come right back again in about two minutes, please. Be right back. Okay, and we are back, and uh, very honored to have uh, been hearing an incredible story from an American hero, Colonel Robert B. Willingham, U.S. Air Force Reserve, retired. They don't make them like Colonel Willingham anymore. Sir, if you would go ahead and uh, tell me a little bit more about the military's efforts to keep you quiet. Now, what the interesting thing is to me is that this gentleman you talked about, who you went to so many crashes with over the years, obviously was told it was okay to take you along. They had that much respect for you, and you had been doing this since 1947, and you ran into him at the site of one of these crashes. When you ran into him for the first time, was it very early on, like in 1947-48, or was it later on? Well, uh, we didn't get together after that first meeting till about... I think must have been about close to 50. All right. And I was getting ready to go to Korea, and I didn't have very much time to work with him. Understand. But <laughs> but, but when you came back on crutches, he, he got in contact with you again, did he? Yes. He got in Well, he, my mother said he called every month to see where I was at and what I was doing. <laughs> Well, you guys got along real well, and he obviously had a great deal of respect for you uh, in addition to that. So you and he were kind of the Pentagon team for investigating early UFO crashes. Well, it could have been, but I didn't like the people they had ahead of that. Mm. It was in the, that mm-hmm. time. But you liked him fine. I liked him fine. He was a fine man. No, I hear that in your voice. Sir. Sure did hate to bring to leave us like he did. How how did he leave us? He just had a heart attack and died. I see. Okay. Now yeah. that uh, that happens, but look at all the wonderful years you had with him. That's to be blessed and. Honest. Yeah, I sure did. I enjoyed him very much. All right. And every time I had a little time off, I'd go see him. He, when in, that's a real friend. A real nice yeah, man. Yeah, he, he was real jam, jam up good feller. Glad to hear it. They don't make people like that very often anymore, except in your case, Colonel, and you're another good one. <laughs> well, take my, take my word other, for it. <laughs> some of them around here don't seem to think so. <laughs> well, I sure do, and you made a lot of friends tonight. Now, did the military ever come up to you? Now, you keep in mind, folks, that Colonel Willingham is working, obviously, with someone out of the Pentagon. Uh, exploring and investigating and researching these crashes. But did they come up to you regarding that piece of metal or anything else and say, look, keep your mouth shut or else? Did they ever get that ugly with you? They was uh, six of them come to a place where I was at, and it was at an air base. And they just walked in there, and they want to know where H. Willingham was. And they come over, and one of them started chewing me out, and another one started bellering, too. And I picked up a ball peen hammer and told them, I said, we don't use that kind of language around here, and if you want to talk to me, lower your voice. Wow, good and for you. And I said, I think it'd be the best if you just got up and went back home. And did they take the hint? 
Yeah, after about five minutes, a couple of my buddies come over, and one of them was six foot four and weighed about 240, and he said, when he says something, you do it. And they got up and left. That's a very, very interesting little vignette. And that was pretty much the end of their hassle on you? Yeah, uh, most of the guys that they sent out to talk to me about them things were real nice people. Mm -hmm. In fact, two of them I'd served with one time. I see. And, uh, you know, uh, just good people. Right. And I didn't mind telling them about them because... If, if, I thought the government should know everything he could find out about them. Right. And that's why I worked on it so hard so long. Understand. Well, I was trying to help the government as much as I was finding out about them. And seeing these little people and everything running around, I, I never got to do that. Did you ever have any of your own... UFO sightings, apart from, from the time you were in your F-86, did you, just as an, a citizen, private citizen, as a youngster, a young boy, did you have any events or experiences that were unusual back then? When I was about 16 years old, they had a sighting over a little town south, uh, uh, west of me here. And uh, I think I've seen that, me and... Uh, friend of mine uh we were talking about it and we went told my mother about it and she told daddy about it and daddy told the sheriff about it and they all cooked out there i see <laughs> that's where you're doing a little town way off from everywhere else you know i see i do i understand all right now as far as the story itself goes You've done a marvelous job of recounting something that was obviously real and obviously from somewhere else. How do you view this now at this stage in your life? Do you think that this knowledge of this planet being visited by other beings, other intelligent life forms, should be the province and kept secret by the government? Or do you think all people have a birthright to know this? What are your views? Well, I'll put it this way. I've seen a lot of things that didn't look right as far as flying. But I do know, and I even went to uh, Virginia and looked at them, and I, I was nearly going to try to get checked out one of them, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, they had made two down in Virginia uh, just like round you know, like what everybody draws when mm -hmm. they say unidentified flying objects, you know. Right, right. But, uh... Now, you say, sir, that these were recreated by us to copy what crashed? Yes. I see. And this the round ones. This would have been in the 50s? No, that was about... 60, I'd say. All right. So we were in the business of trying to duplicate or replicate some of these crashed objects back in the in the late, certainly the late 50s or very early 60s uh, or before then. Uh, was was the effort to replicate these, as far as you could tell, a very serious one to try to get something that would fly or just to try and see if we could even duplicate the basic shape of the things? Oh, they uh, flew them. They'd get off about uh, 18 feet off the ground and uh, things with it. But they didn't have the right kind of the power to go in that that the regular saucers had in them. Colonel, are you saying you, you witnessed a duplicated, crashed UFO, ET flown, that we made, that we actually were able to get up off the ground? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, they film on it. In fact, I think I got one. You think I'll you have a... If I have, I'll let you have it. You have a film of one? 
Well, they'll be knocking yeah, on your. They'll be. I'll tell you right now. If you got it, uh, you better have that six foot four friend of yours hanging around because they'll be over knocking on your door tomorrow morning asking for it. I wouldn't give it to them. But uh, this is. Oh, you you check. If you get that that film, make sure that Ruben and and Noe get it, uh, and it's copied. Uh, well, because... I just found it. Uh, it been hit for about. Eight years. All right. Well, <laughs> Reuben and Noah, you know how important this is, so I'm 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 sure they'll be on this. I I am. Uh, yeah, this I'll is very look important. it up. And I'll make right. sure Reuben gets it. All right, uh, and I'd be very honored to see it at some point. Uh, sure we, can. We have uh, we have to take a break. Uh, can you hang on for a little bit longer, another ten minutes or so? Well, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm not just gonna hang on. I'm going to go uh, get a drink of water, as you, you say. You do that. And, you do whatever else okay. you need to do, and then you come back. I want to talk to you a little bit more. All right, go get All your right. drink of water, sir. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Bye. Yeah. Uh, bring Ruben and Noe back up real quick, if you can, uh, studio. You there, Ruben? Yes. Uh, Noe. Yes, I'm right here. All right, you guys, that that's an absolutely an astonishing interview, and we'll ask our third-hour guest just to stand by a little longer. I want to say proper good night and thanks to Robert. Have 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 we missed anything that that you need to have included in here to make this a, a, a total presentation that you'd like to have? I think well, uh, I think ahead, most no. of the major topics have been covered. Ruben and I have just been. Sitting here stunned uh, uh, all over again listening to this amazing story. Well, me too. I mean, we just heard him say that we replicated these things and he saw them flying, albeit low to the ground, with not the same propulsion, in around 1960. Well, I, I, I think he was referring, Jeff, to he told us he flew the Avro car. Do you remember? Yeah, sure. If he actually had a chance to test for, uh, yeah, I understand. Uh, but that's it. that. What he was saying was that we had duplicated the basic shape, and we were able to get them up off the ground. Mm-hmm. I didn't know the Avro went back to the six, 1960, though. I thought it was uh, later than that. But okay, fascinating. Uh, we'll come back, uh, gentlemen. Thank you. I'm going to say a, a proper good night to him, and then we'll bring you back on, and uh, we'll kind of do a little review, and and uh, then say good night to you. So thank you. Stand by. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back in just a few more minutes. Okay, welcome back. Uh, just, I'm almost without words. This has been an extraordinary conversation. Uh, Colonel, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Well, sir, I want to thank you, but before I say good night, I want to ask you if there's anything you'd like to add to this story, and you've done a, just a fantastic job of explaining it. Well, I... I... I'm thinking right now about getting me a stenographer and writing down everything from 1940 to now. 1940. Yeah. That goes back to the Missouri crash, if I'm not mistaken, or somewhere around. Right. There. You were in. Did you go see that one too? I uh, went by there when they <laughs> set it up in the uh, <clears throat> more or less. Uh, a place to where you go look at that stuff, uh, in an old hangar. I they had, they had name that town. Cape Girardeau. Yeah, was that it, sounds pretty close. Uh, was it, was there some wreckage there that they had on display? Yes. And they claim it was a flying saucer and, uh, mm-hmm. I went in there and looked at it and I didn't believe it. Because they didn't have wheels like that on the flying saucers and when, things like that. I huh. th- thought it was somebody that had made one and was flying it. Uh, I see. 
Well, that's certainly, certainly uh, within the realm of possibility. I think your idea is very good. Uh, I think Noe and Ruben might want to help you with that. Uh, just get your all of your experiences put down on uh, a recording device, and then someone could type them up. Uh, this is part of our our heritage on the planet as a species to know these things. Our government, of course, as you well know, does not think we are deserving of knowing that we are being visited by intelligent life forms continually. Probably have been here maybe long before we have. Well, yes. I figured they were here before we even got here the first time. I wouldn't be surprised if That's we were. That's the way some, I looked at it. We might even be something they created long ago. Who knows? Or meddled with That's somehow. Right. That's right. I hope you do I, put your I memories down. I always have an open mind when it comes to these. Yes. Or try to. You have one of and the great, you, sir. You have one of the great stories that I have ever heard in my life. One of the most important stories, and I, I do encourage you to. Even if you just take it one event at a time and sit down and just just speak into a recording device as much as you can remember, I'm sure that Ruben and, and Noe will help you and, and make sure you get the proper support to do this. This is one of the most important breakthroughs in UFO research that I have ever been privileged to be a, a tiny part of and just to listen in. Uh, you are bringing to the table the truth that many of us know and have heard fragments of, but for some reason, sir, you have been involved in the primary thread of this whole phenomenon, which is the investigation of actual crashed hardware and dead occupants, and some occupants that obviously weren't dead. What do you know about what do you know about the Roswell crash? You can tell us. Well, I was stationed down at White Sands when it happened. Yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a lot of stuff went on down there I really didn't approve of, and uh, I uh, kind of got up and got asked him if I could go somewhere else. <laughs> really? What? What? If you if you can just briefly tell me what was it about what was going on down there that didn't sit right with you, just in general terms? What was it? The attitude what? of the people? Well, the people down there, uh, the way they were, we'd say one guy said, well, I've seen these two people laying out here. And they'd all jump up and say, no, you didn't see no people laying out there. It wasn't nothing like that, you know, and things like that. And they'd say, oh, you you were seeing things or you were probably drunk that night. And, uh, I said, now, don't say he was drunk because I can't even get him to smell of the bottle. <laughs> yeah, I don't like it either. I understand what you're saying. Did you uh, yeah. Did you go to the Roswell site at all? No, I okay. didn't. Can you, I was can... busy as a cat on a hot tin roof then. They were making stuff down there that I had to have, and I had to stay there and make sure they got stayed at it. <laughs> you were in charge. Can you tell our listeners, and I, you're speaking to a lot of very wise people here, unequivocally, without question, that the Roswell crash or crashes did happen? Yes, it did. It did happen, and it was very poorly taken care of. You've got to have a lot of sympathy for uh, Jesse Marcel having to sit there with that phony weather balloon crap in those pictures. You can see on yes. his face how unhappy he was. Well, I, I, can, I know what he, he was going through. Yeah. I one time went by there in a Jeep, and uh, I stopped and I said, We brought you a six-pack. Thought maybe I had to help what was going on here. <laughs> he just died laughing. You did that to Jesse? Yeah. <laughs> well, what a what an amazing little sidelight. Just amazing. Good for you. Uh, we we had to do something or we'd have lost our minds. Yeah, I hear you. I we hear you. We had well, to keep something going on. Yeah. yeah. That's a that's an amazing little story. 
I, I would, I'm going to let you get some rest, uh, and I want to also tell you that if you would like to come back on the program at your convenience in a week or two or whenever you'd like to, as long as the, the, the goons from the government don't come down and threaten you, and I have a hunch it doesn't matter if they did, you'd, you'd still do what you're exactly going to do anyhow. That's the kind of man you are. But you're welcome to come back on this program and talk to me and our listeners about what you've been through and share as much of this as you'd like. Well, I don't think the government's going to bother me very much. Uh, I've well, lost my legs and I've lost my back and my mind's going and things like that. And I don't think they'll bother me. Colonel, your mind is uh, working better than uh, 90% of what they call Americans now walking around out there. So, <laughs> don't well, you thank even, you very much. Don't you go I there. I about to think I was losing it. No, sir. Uh, so please uh, consider this an invitation and uh, just let uh, Reuben or Noe uh, know that you'd like to come back on and spend a little time talking with us about whatever you'd like, and I'll be honored to do that. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate you letting me do it. Honest, my pleasure, sir. Take good care, and I do hope to talk to you again, and thank you. All right, thank you, and tell the two boys there you got, I said, go home go to bed. <laughs> All right, They're, they will, I will. Good night, sir. <laughs> yeah, okay, night. bye-bye. Right. Good night. Uh, are the two boys there? I'm right here, uh, Jeff. <laughs> Amazing. I, 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 uh, yeah. Well, you, I can't even begin to extend my thanks to both of you for making this possible. And, uh, he, he wants, he wants to tell it all. And I know you'll be on it. Yeah, he's a great, very, like he said, a, a great hero. Truly. Jeff, I wanted yeah. to point out that he really brought forward a lot more details tonight. It was Did really he? amazing. Uh, there was a lot of information that has come back into his mind in the two years since our book was published. Mm -hmm. And so some of the information he shared tonight is uh, was just, uh, it, it really floored us. Um, he, he has been thinking about this a lot since he helped us, uh, since we got the book together with his help. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, he filled in a lot more detail for example, what he saw in the crashed craft uh, that really has never been heard or seen anywhere before until tonight. So Ruben and I would like to thank you for uh, kind of getting the colonel out of his shell and having him come forward and give a lot more vivid information than even we had on hand two years ago when we did the book. Wow. Well, he's a remarkable man, and, and uh, I just couldn't have enjoyed speaking to anyone any more than and talking to that that fine American hero. Uh, and uh, he, you heard his mind was coming alive. You heard it. I it's yeah. just right there. That's correct. Yeah. Just like it was yesterday with him. All right, gentlemen, we're about out of time this, this go-round, but uh, please, uh, in a week or two, if, if he'd like to come back, uh, talk to him. Uh, we'll set it up, uh, just to have him list some other things he'd like to discuss, and we'll do it any time you'd like. Great, uh, Jeff. Um, he, he, there's more chapters through to his life. That's for I'm sure. sure. I'm sure. Uh, Noe, thank you, my friend. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for having us. Our yes. pleasure. Ruben, right. take good care. Talk soon. Thank you, sir. Take, okay. thank you very much, Jeff. Good night. Good, good night. All right. All right. Wow. We're going to pause and we will be back.